Hello and welcome everyone. It's February 2nd, 2024, and we are returning for Active Math Stream 8.2 with Richard Servajon. Introduction to Bayesian Mechanics, Free Energy Principle, and the Paths Based Formalism. Thank you, Richard, for joining for this part two. Looking forward to your presentation and then discussion. I have a weird echo. Um, wait. Are you in general synchrony with yourself on YouTube? Um, wait, let me see. Okay, perfect, sorry. Um, okay. Great, so, go for it. Hi everyone, and thank you again, um, Daniel. So today I'm going to present the path-based uh, formulation of the free energy principle. Um, and I'm going to start by a brief reminder of a couple of things we discussed last time. I, however, if you're not acquainted at all with the notions of synchronization map of um, variational inference or Langevin equations, it can be a good idea to uh, watch the first video. And if you do so, please check the comment I posted below where I precise um, and correct a few things. So a quick reminder of where we started and where we... So basically, if you consider such sparsely coupled random dynamical system, where mu corresponds to the internal states, eta to the external states, and A and S, the blanket states, to respectively the active and sensory states. And they form together the so-called Markov blanket. Uh, and just a bit more vocabulary, A and mu form together the so-called autonomous states. And finally, if you add the sensory states to the autonomous states, so you consider the whole Markov blanket plus the internal states, uh, you end up with the so-called particular states, pi. And the particular states defines or constitute a particle, an agent, uh, bacteria in my schematic, for instance. So if you consider such sparsely coupled random dynamical system, you can interpret the dynamics of the autonomous states in terms of perceptual and active inference. More precisely, you can see here in the bottom of my slide that the autonomous mode minimized a free energy function, which is defined under a generative model, which is typically the nest density, the non-equilibrium steady state density uh, of your system. So more uh, precisely, the internal states mu parameterize the density Q mu over external states, and if you look at the path of the internal mode, it is so that the, the free energy associated with your um, variational density is always minimized. And this licenses an interpretation in terms of uh, Bayesian inference. And about action, because you can see here that the active uh, mode is also a minimizer of the free energy. In fact, it minimizes the surprise term within free energy so that you can see the particle as actively sampling unsurprising or preferred uh, sensory states, sensory inputs, which is active inference. And yeah, if you remember well the last video, we saw that the generative model encodes the preferences of your system. So that was basically where we started and where we ended last time. And today, I want to uh, relax a couple of hypotheses. So first of all, uh, no steady state is assumed. We could be at steady state, we could have a well-defined uh, nest density, uh, but we, do no, we don't do any assumptions here. There is no steady state assumed. The second, so it, it extends in a way the scope of the free energy principle. The second thing we, we do is to relax the white noise assumption. This means that we don't deal anymore with infinitely rough fluctuations, but we have 
fluctu fluctuations which uh, which are uh, smooth. Uh, so basically, we deal with colored or correlated noise, and this means that the fluctuation the fluctuations become differentiable up to a certain order. So basically, instead of dealing just with x and x prime, let's say you have x prime prime and so on and so forth. You have higher dynamical orders, if you will. Note that this vector x here, which precisely corresponds to x, x prime, and so on, is called the generalized states. And a shifted vector, this one, where the first component is x prime, we refer to it as the generalized motion. And we also say that we work in so-called generalized coordinates of motion, not to be confused with generalized coordinates in analytical mechanics. So a lot of words, but we just we are just saying that the fluctuations are smooth now, and we can differentiate uh, these fluctuations up to a certain order. And this order is the order of generalized motion, and it tells you how large the the correlation uh, length of the fluctuations is basically. I also want to introduce the notion of generalized state space. So basically, you can augment state space with uh, generalized motion. So instead of just looking at x, the state of your system, you look at x prime, x prime prime, etc. And so basically, we consider the so-called generalized state space. Okay, so um, a lot, once again, a lot of words just to say that fluctuations are smooth now. So if you look at the equation below, it seems that there, there is uh, dots and primes here, which, and it's, it seems a bit redundant. So in fact, what we call x dot here, you can view it as the actual time derivative um that you can evaluate anywhere for instance at t equal to and the x prime here is just the um, second com component of the momentary generalized states of your system uh for instance at t equal to so that if you evaluate your time derivative at t equal to it equates indeed x prime but the distinction between the two will become more clear later in the context of generalized filtering so the cool thing here is that if you perform a Taylor expansion of the state of your system, so you have an equation like that, you can see that generalized states constitute the coefficients of your expansion. Indeed, you can see in this formula here that you have x, x prime, x prime prime, etc. So basically, you do a, a Taylor expansion around equal to, basically, and the coefficients of your expansions are generalized states. So in a way, you can see generalized states are as encoding a path, as encoding the future of your uh, of the state of your system, thanks to this Taylor expansion. And that's basically what I wrote here. A point in generalized state space corresponds to a path. That's exactly what I, I just said uh, in virtue of this Taylor expansion here. So a consequence of that is that if you look at the surprise over generalized states, the so negative log p of vector x here, and we call it the generalized Lagrangian, it plays the role of an action scoring the likelihood of a local path over the correlation length of fluctuations. So let me break down a bit this idea. Once again, here, the 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 order of generalized motion depends on how smooth the noise is so basically when you look you do this taylor expansion um the the time scale considered here uh, corresponds to the the correlation length of your uh, fluctuations the more uh, correlated your noise is the more dynamical orders you have in a way the larger the path encoded by generalized states. And the corresponding surprise, the corresponding generalized Lagrangian, negative log P of vector X, is a quantity that scores the likelihood of this path in virtue of the correspondence between points in generalized state space and paths. 
So a, la a last remark I want to to do in order to be sure that uh, everything is clear here is the following. You might be a bit confused, especially if you have a physics background, uh, because Lagrangians and actions are two different things. So let's take a let's take a, a step back and ask. I have a path, uh, trajectory in state space, if you will, and I want to compute a, a probability density associated with a path. How should I do? So the first thing to do is, is to discretize time. So basically, you discretize your Langevin equation. So for the people acquainted with stochastic calculus, just notice that it means choosing your alpha discretization, either Ito or Satonovich, let's say. And from your discretized Langevin equation, you define an, infin an infinitesimal propagator, just like for path integrals in quantum mechanics. An infinitesimal propagator is just a transition density between one state to the next during a time window dt. Then you multiply the infinitesimal propagators, and then you go to the continuous time limits. And so in a nutshell, that how you proceed to compute, to write down a density associated with a path. And if you do that, for instance, in the simple case of a Wiener process where the noise is a Gaussian white noise, you end up with the density of a path being proportional to the exponential of minus something. And this something, we call it the action. So the smaller the action, the more likely the corresponding path. And this action, in fact, corresponds to an integral over your path of something, and we call this something a Lagrangian. So a lag the Lagrangian is defined at any point in time while the action characterizes the path as a whole thing. So conceptually speaking, Lagrangians and actions are two very different things. But here, the key move is to uh, kind of leverage the idea that a point in generalized state space encodes a path so that the surprise over generalized states, this negative log P of X, which is defined as a generalized Lagrangian, plays a role indeed of an action, once again, scoring the likelihood of a local path over the correlation length of fluctuations. So that's really the core idea underlying the path-based formulation of the free energy principle. So basically, uh, now that we have um, introduced these ideas, let's look at the generalized Lagrangian over uh, autonomous states. So I just want to point out that throughout the presentation, in virtue of this correspondence between points in generalized states and path, I will, um, I will call generalized states path. For instance, here I would say the Lagrangian of autonomous path. I use these words in an interchangeable way. And similarly, when I, I'm dealing with uh, an autonomous uh, path minimizing a, lag, a generalized Lagrangian, I will be talking of uh, the, the path of least action because Lagrangians play the role of an action. So be aware of this terminology. So if I'm looking at this generalized Lagrangian of autonomous path, so negative log P of alpha. The cool thing here is that if I remove fluctuations, noise on particular states or path, so basically the particle respond uh, deterministically to its environment, I can rewrite this Lagrangian like that. And this formula coincides with an expected free energy. So what this formula is all about, well, we can uh, reorganize it and if we do so, you can, for instance, write it that way. So what it means is basically that uh, the path minimizing this Lagrangian, so the most uh, likely autonomous path, average over all possible sensory paths, has to minimize these two terms. And these two terms are very interesting because the first one, if you look at it, is it is an expected Lagrangian over sensory path. So minimizing this Lagrangian means, this expected Lagrangian means following an autonomous path which yields unsurprising or preferred sensory path. 
and, and therefore it can be viewed indeed as an expected cost you want to minimize. And if you minimize also the, um, the second term, this uh, negative expected information gain, you can see that it is just an expected KL divergence between two density. And these two densities, the difference between these two densities is just that the first one here is conditioned upon S. So basically, these two densities are different if the sensory path is informative. So maximizing this expected information gain means following an autonomous path yielding uh, an informative sensory path. For instance, let's say you are in a dark room where there is an ambiguous mapping between the hidden latent uh, the hidden uh, external states and the sensory stimuli let's say you can turn on the light and then this action would yield informative uh, sensory inputs so that's the idea underlying the maximization of this expected information gain so this quantity is very rich and in fact you can do connections and links with many established ideas. For instance, you can speak of um, optimal Bayesian decisions and optimal Bayesian design or of uh, pragmatic value and epistemic value, etc. The whole idea here is that this quantity entails the um, uh, preference-seeking imperatives of the particles, that's the first term, and the information-seeking imperatives of the part particles, that's the second term. So the path minimizing this Lagrangian kind of constitutes the best direction of travel, the optimal uh, direction of travel for the particle, so that you can view the particle as constantly engaging in an optimal behavior. Okay, so now, have, having said that, I want to go back to the whole idea of synchronization map we talked about uh, last week. So in fact, in this setting, everything is exactly the same. We just augmented state space, if you will. But you have mu parameterizing a density. Everything is the same. And if we consider the internal path of least action, so the, the internal path minimizing this Lagrangian here, the corresponding parameterized density over external path coincide with the density over external path given sensory path. So that if you write down the corresponding free energy, we, you have the first term which vanishes in virtue of this above equality here, and free energy reduces to surprise, if you will, to this Lagrangian over particular path. I'm going to, so before using this to uh, derive directly the free energy principle, I need to, uh, briefly introduce uh, the notion of generalized filtering. So in a nutshell, let's say that you have some data. You have the vector S here, a sensory path, let's say, and you want to compute negative log P of S. That's the quantity you ultimately want to uh, evaluate. But it's intractable. Let's say that computing this P of S would require a monstrous marginalization and you can't directly uh, compute this guy. Instead, you define a proxy, you define the, an upper bound, this variational free energy, which is parameterized by mu, by vector mu. And you just want to minimize this free energy so that it coincides with what you ultimately want to compute, namely, once again, negative log P of S. So in order to minimize indeed this free energy, you just follow uh, a recognition or filtering dynamics, which is in fact a gradient descent on, on free energy. In fact, the, the exact dynamics at play here is this equation here. So you could ask, but why don't we just have the gradient term here, nabla f? Why do, do we have a second term here, this d mu? By the way, about this d mu here, what is it? Well, the matrix D here is just this uh, matrix with ones here in, in this uh, line. So basically, if you have a vector x, let's say x, 
x prime x prime prime and so on and you want um to 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 get from this vector a shifted vector x prime the motion if you will you just have to apply this matrix d here and on x and it gives you indeed x prime and so basically you can view this d mu here as being equal to mu prime basically and the idea is that you when once you the gradient term here is minimized when free energy is minimized so we we look at the stationary solution of this equation if you will mu dot coincide with d mu and let me just explain why we don't just have the gradient term here if we only had the gradient term without the d mu here we would go down on free energy until a minimum is reached and basically we would have the first component of the vector mu being non-zero but all the higher dynamical orders would be zero because we are at the minimum of free energy and we don't move anymore but here it is a wall vector mu which parameterizes free energy and we don't want all the entries to be zero and we want a, an, an equation which gu guarantees that so that we add an additional term in the equation so that's basically in a nutshell what generalized filtering is all about and by the way note that if you consider the path of least action of uh, some process x you can write it in a very similar fashion the only difference is that here the quantity minimized is just the the this Lagrange, generalized lagrangian here whereas it was free energy in the context of generalized filtering and by the way we just saw before that if uh, we that if we consider the path the internal path of least action the corresponding free energy here associated with the density the internal path of least action parameterize it reduces to the lagrangian so that when we write down the equations here uh, verified by the autonomous path of least action you can directly identify free energy to the lagrangian and we basically have the same equations that in generalized filtering so basically uh, if we look at the autonomous path of least action you can uh, interpret the dynamics of the internal path of least action so in terms of bayesian inference which takes the form here of a bayesian filtering scheme and note that if we remove fluctuations on particular states or paths that's the definition of dealing with a conservative particle the autonomous path will coincide with the autonomous path of least action and note that ignoring fluctuations might be relevant when it comes to very large particles uh, where you can uh, so to very large particle you can coarse grain and you can uh, check these papers here where, where they try to average out fluctuations using a renormalization group approach so in the end we find the free energy principle just as before uh, but the difference is that here the, um, the 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 bayesian inference takes the form of a bayesian filtering scheme but otherwise we still end up with a variational principle accounting for the, the, the for the perceptual and active inference that the particle do. So, okay, now I want to do a bit of zoology, of typology, let's say. I said last time that this sparse coupling architecture here was a canonical sparse coupling architecture but it was not a definitive feature of the free energy principle and that we could look at other sparse coupling architecture and i want now to look at various sparse coupling architecture so the most simple ones you could imagine is one like that where you don't have active states so basically uh, the, the you only have the Markov blanket is only made of sensory states. In the end, you can still 
uh, write down the internal path of list action like that, but it will the idea that the particle encodes beliefs about its external environment, it will not manifest to an observer because by definition, an observer has only access to the Markov blanket. And that's what this quote is all about when it says that whether internal paths of least action parameterize beliefs about external paths and therefore minimize operational free energy can only manifest via active states, that is, in active particles. And of course, no one would attribute any form of agency or uh, sentience to a simple piece of rock, for instance. So if we move to the realm of active particles now, we basically have the equations we uh, studied before. But the difference here with this sparse coupling architecture is that the active states do not directly interact with the external states and the sensory states do not directly interact with the internal states. This uh, sparse coupling architecture is quite interesting because it reminds, I would say, it reminds the, um, the way a bacteria is coupled with its environment because you would have like the outer membrane with all the transmembrane proteins, the receptors, whatever, which would correspond to the sensory states. And then you would have the underlying cortex filaments, which mediate many, many aspects of biotic actions. So I like I liked very much this uh, architecture here. But we can even go further in the sophistication and consider the so-called strange particles. The only move here is that we don't have any arrow from S to eta, but more importantly, we don't have any arrow from A to mu. So the active states do not directly uh, influence the internal states. And this is interesting because it means that now the internal states alone are independent of both the active and the external states when conditioned upon the sensory state. So from the point of view of the internal states, the active states become a latent cause, just like the external states of the sensory of the sensory states. So basically everything is the same. You can write down a variational density parameterized by the internal states or path, but now it is over both the external and the active path. And so we have this free energy here. We call it the generalized free energy uh, G, but everything is the same. It's just a variational free energy associated with our recognition density, which is over both external and active path. So that in the end, we have this equation here where you have in the equation of the internal path of least action, the gradient on, um, on G here. So it's very interesting because it basically means that the internal path infers, infers and in fact cause uh, the, its own action um the the its own action which then cause its sensory uh inputs so and i'm quoting here the paper which introduced the notion of strange particles you can view the active particle the active uh, path sorry as realizing the sensory consequences of the inferred action so basically such a particle kind of author its own action its own uh, action and so the idea here is that the particle kind of infer its its own course of action, which will yield preferred sensory outcomes. So it's really a form of planning of inference. Strange particles do planning as inference. So that's that's uh, quite cool. And in fact, we can even go go a bit further and assume a certain level of sparsity within internal states. So you would have this mu1 here, which influence mu2, but not the other way around. So from the point of view of the whole uh, internal states, everything is the same. You have uh, it parameterized altogether uh, density q mu. 
And by the way, under a mean field approximation, you can write it that way, where you would have Q mu one and Q mu two here. But the re very cool thing here is that from the point of view of mu one alone, well, mu one is independent of mu two a and eta when conditioned upon s, and you can view mu one alone as parameterizing a density over mu two a and eta. And we call it that way with the overscript m. So basically, q mu one is a density or a belief about mu two, and therefore about q mu two, so that you can view this q mu one m as a metacognitive belief because it constitutes a belief about a belief because it's a belief about q mu two. So that just by assuming this simple uh, architecture within internal states, we end up with a, a, a minimal Bayesian mechanics, let's say, of metacognition. And it also uh, introduces the notion of metacognitive particles. So I think that's uh, what Bayesian mechanics is all about, meaning uh, translating cognitive abilities in simple physical terms. It constitutes, in a way, a physics of uh, cognition, if you will. So ha having said that, uh, thank you very much. And especially thanks to all these guys here, which who, uh, helped me a lot uh, understanding uh, the free energy principle and especially the path-based formulation of the free energy principle. Thank you. All right, awesome. Great. A lot of ways I could start, but it's so interesting that um, how smoothly the path based continues on. So maybe could you give a remark on just the timeline in the literature, which one of these state and path based were developed just roughly like in which ordering was one first or how did that happen? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not an expert on the history of the free energy principle, but I know that thinking in terms of uh, path and in terms of generalized filtering has been around for um, forever, in fact, in the literature, but about um, the most, um, I would say, uh, definitive formulation in such terms, I would say that the most important paper is um, well, I have it here. Uh, it's called Path Integrals. Well, where it is, uh, I can't see it. Um, well, uh, Friston Physics of Life Review 2023B Path uh, yeah, Integrals yeah, Particular um, Kinds. Yeah, exactly. The, this paper here, Path Integrals Particular Kinds and Strange Things. Which is also the paper, so we, we which introduce um, all this typology of particles, and it kind of really uh, formulated the free energy principle that way. Um, so I think that's pretty much a very very important paper, and actually the one which introduced the notion of metacognitive particles, the one of uh, Lenz and Lars. Um, this one towards the Bayesian mechanics of metacognitive particles, the last one, it is actually a commentary, a short commentary, very easily readable of the path integral paper we just mentioned. Um, and also I would say that in the 2022 paper, the free energy principle made sim simpler, but not too simple, uh, published in 2023, actually. Uh, it is mainly it mainly focused on the state based formulation, but it it also uh, talk about uh, paths and generalized states. Um, so it it it's uh, also a, a very nice um, a very nice papers, and it kind of derives the whole thing from scratch. So I think this paper is also very very important. Um, and yeah, I think basically in the last two or three years, there have been many papers uh, reformulating the free energy principle or grounding it in in in, in 
solid math and so on. So it's, I think currently, and let's say the, the few years which followed from the 2019 monography of Carl Friston, it has been very important years about uh, when it comes specifically to Bayesian mechanics and the actual physics underlying the free energy principle. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just restate that. I think there's a few great points to explore. So even as early as the early 2000s, there was the notion that there was like physics of consciousness, physics of cognitive systems, a free energy principle for the brain. There were physics based equations in the 2010 Friston paper. There's a big tree with all these different inference algorithms. However, they were all just kind of branches on that tree, a little bit more evocatively or, or aspirationally, but not formally. Then dot, 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 2019, free energy principle for a particular physics and the reading group and all the work around that. Mm. And then especially in the last year since then, um, I think that the the decision and the move that you made to lead with the state based, and then almost nothing had to be said today. Of course, it was a great presentation, but you said it all that we pointify the path. We make paths into points in a given space. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about like being in a car and then there's one path where like, my first derivative is one for two seconds and then it stops. And then that was that path. And there's another path where my first derivative is one for four seconds and then I stopped. And so all of those different paths, which do take the car to different locations, they are also just points in this generalized space. And then there's this interpretation of those coefficients as the Taylor series expansion, mm -hmm. but it just shows how versatile the formalism is because it can take points in arbitrary state spaces, which means, yes, you could imagine arbitrary state spaces that correspond to Taylor series expansions or potentially other kinds of constructs. Mm -hmm. What do we get from paths? So, in fact, I think there are um, a couple of things which uh, motivated such a formulation, because when uh, I mean about the usual uh, state-based formulation we talked about last time, there was uh, many critiques. Many, I mean, it was there was many debates. For instance, about the question about the net density being at steady state, is it really uh, relevant when it comes to real system, to real biological systems, for instance? So there was many uh, things which are now um, addressed by the path-based formula formulation, uh, because as we saw, we relaxed a couple of hypotheses. And also the second thing, which is very very much at the core of the path-based formulation, as you said, is, I mean, the, the, the fact to move from um, states to path, to path which are in fact encoded by generalized states, it allows you to, to, to speak of the future, uh, to, the, in, to speak to the future path, so that you can develop a physics of particles planning, for instance, which was not at all uh, the case with the previous formulation. So having such extension of the scope of the um, free energy principle, it allows you to, to literally describe the Bayesian mechanics of particles planning. Uh, and, and so it's the fact to think in terms of path as opposed to states, it allows you to develop a physics of, let's say, higher other cognitive abilities, I would say. Uh, so it's it's definitely very, very cool and uh, uh, a great achievement, let's say. Responding to that, um, I would say planning is possible in the state-based formalism. It's just more of a brute force tree branching engineering problem. 
So it's almost like in the state-based formalism, there was a physics of the perception action loop, and then there were classical computer science ways to deal with the branching of planning, just like a chess algorithm, like how many depth deep in the time horizon, and then there's all these secondary strategies for branching uh, and pruning that search tree. But there's kind of like few to none in terms of the guarantee of the um, time horizons of policy, you just kind of had to enumerate all the possible options. Um, but the real-time kernel was physically grounded and beautiful, and then planning had to be a little bit enumerated. But when we have mm. the path as an atomic entity, um, then we can kind of extend the, the elegance or the simplicity that we were dealing with states in the moment, but now our state in the moment is like a Taylor expansion. And this comes up a lot in the distinction between the discrete time and the continuous time models, like figure 4.3 in the textbook, where in a discrete time model, if you want to plan a hundred time steps in the future, there's some variable, you know, T sub 100, like you literally are making a prediction and, but you have no prediction for T sub 99.5. You're just making discrete predictions. Whereas a Taylor series, even a Taylor series for a super complex function, and you're only going to go two levels of differentiation in, you will have a prediction even for any point. It might be radically wrong, but you get the whole support from negative to positive infinity basically for free without guarantees of it being accurate, but it's like you've kind of pinned yourself to the timeline and then every single derivative that you take is giving you a better handle on that path for sure. You'll never do worse. And so that is like... So similar, yet also very different setting. It's true that I said that the time scale, scale considered was basically the correlation length of fluctuations on the number of the order of generalized motion. But in principle, your Taylor expansion applied to, I mean, it's infinite. Um, but of course, above, beyond the correlation length of fluctuations, it becomes wrong. And I also want to say about what you said in the beginning uh, about the state-based the the state-based formulation. Yeah, it's it's true. And actually, in um, in the paper, the free energy principle, simpler but not too simple. They um, they uh, so you can write down the the action of a path. So here we we have a Gaussian white noise. Everything is is. Um, so we, we, we are really in the state-based formulation of the FEP. You can write the action of a path and you realize that it coincides with an expected free energy as well. So you don't need to be in the path-based uh, formulation to uh, go to, to get to the expected free energy thing, um, which equates the action of autonomous path or here in our Path-based formulation it equates a generalized Lagrangian of uh, autonomous path. So, so yeah. Mm. Could you come back to where there was the generalized Lagrangian? So this is a. Um. Okay, maybe a, a one before this. Yes. Okay. Thank you. For those of us outside of the non-active physics world, how is action used? What does action correspond to in physical systems when we're talking about action as generalized Lagrangian? Is this the same thing as what we're talking about with policy selection and movement and embodied action? How is this physics concept of action being used? So first of all, I would say that there is, I mean, it depends on 
what we're talking about um, when it comes to actions in Lagrangian, we, are, we usually think of um, analy analytical mechanics, but here it would be more in the context of stochastic calculus. And in the context of stochastic calculus and path integrals in stochastic calculus, the action is just a quantity which scores the likelihood of a path. So if, for instance, the density of a path is uh, the exponential of minus something, you would call by identification this uh, thing the action. And basically, the smaller the action, the more likely the path because the higher the density of your path and vice versa. So by the way, when we were saying, for instance, here that the action is equal to, I mean, we define it as negative log density of a path. In principle, if the density, I mean, when it comes to the usual definition of the de of the action, if I write my density as a normalization factor times the exponential of minus the action, then if I take the negative log of this density, I would have the regular action plus something, and usually this uh, constant is dis is discarded. We um, we just don't consider it, so that the action reduces to negative log density of a path. But conceptually speaking, this action is very different from the idea of Lagrangian because basically the act. I mean, usually speaking, the action is the integral over time over your path of um, of uh, a quantity called the Lagrangian. So at every point in time, there is a quantity defined, and this is the Lagrangian, which is defined at any point in time, while the action is a quantity which characterizes paths as whole thing. So conceptually speaking, actions in Lagrangians are very different things. Lagrangians, once again, are defined at any point in time, while the action Okay, Lagrangian was defined at any point in time while the action. Okay, I'll wait a few seconds for Richard to rejoin. If you're watching live, please feel free to write questions in the chat and we'll look at them. It. you're back it's all good yeah, yeah. lagrangian Perfect. is defined at every point in time and then the action yeah. and basically um so in order to just uh answer what you well uh here yeah when you said that is it different from uh, the notion of action when in the active uh literature for instance and so on here we, we use the word action, uh, but it has nothing to do with uh, the notion of action, like acting in the world, etc. So yeah, for the people who never um, meet this concept, so it can be super confusing, I, I guess, when you uh, when he, when you read Bayesian mechanics papers, you you, you don't really know <laughs> what action is uh, we are talking about. But yeah, they are very different. I know it's funny, like each path has an action value the negative log density that in a way summarizes what we could say are the actions that that path entails but yet the actions are the affordances that are taken on mm. that path that are summarized by the physics action um so there's yeah the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um also yeah very um cutting edge with reviewing the typology of particles and the DaCosta and Sanved Smith metacognitive particle. Um, that shows, I, I think, a few things. One, that often there are implicit concepts and qualitative concepts that are built up. Like long have people said that there is a continuity of modeling between rocks and societies for example 
popes and plaintiffs and plankton, all these other funny things that, that Friston et al. say. But not until this paper did we see the simple, the conservative, and the strange. And then with that Target article, just with the DaCosta and Sandvid Smith work, they kind of take that in another level and like compose off to the side. And now we can go into a metacognitive depth, combining back to like the hierarchical nested meta awareness work of Sandvid Smith from 2021. So it's just very cool how there's like a kind of earlier first pass qualitative intuition and then the empirical research question is like where can we build the high-speed rail lines and this is like the blueprint for the high-speed rail now and then the next level will be like actually making the simulations or whatever it is to kind of show that this is not just something that you can make in powerpoint but this is actually something where the rabbit is going to be evincing some kind of yeah. behavior that it couldn't otherwise but it's kind of like that's like in a way it's not the only way but it is like an agenda between the um intuitive to the sketched and just it builds forward in these ways that are being reviewed pretty clearly and changing on a month by month yeah and i think i mean this i i mean this agenda of translating um concepts like cognitive abilities and stuff in simple physical terms is, is quite interesting and i i mean we we discussed it on by message on discord but it's it's um it would be cool and it's it's coming it's happening but uh it's cool it could be cool to for the this uh bayesian mechanics this field to be more known and recognized by the physics community, because if you meet like a regular physicist working, for instance, in the physics of complex systems on or on in biological physics or biophysics and stuff like that, it I mean you have like a 0 0.999 probability that he never heard of Bayesian mechanics. While we have a whole agenda to 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 following, is I think there is way more to to be done. It's like the the down of this uh, field of this agenda, let's say. So I think the the next years are quite exciting in that regard. I I totally agree. Like one meme or theme on that for me is like the base graph on the screen on the table it is what it is and then there's the second level where we annotate or assert that graph with cognitive phenomena like well this graph reflects attention or awareness of attention or metacognition or regret or whatever we're modeling we kind of make an assertion about the Bayes graph and like you said it's the dawn this isn't the answer on metacognition this is like one very snappy very um following in line way of modeling metacognition yeah but there's I, no I, end there's no end to that question of how do you model metacognition and so then it's just like every time in a psychology paper or a, any we see like a cognitive phenomena which can include everything from anticipation you know past present future that's like our keyhole to bridge with this generalized unifying perspective on cognitive systems. Yeah, I totally agree. This work is really, um, this work here uh, on the slide is very like a first work, but I mean, the, when it comes to metacognition, for instance, or, I mean, I'm not an expert at all, but there are many concepts, I don't know, mental actions, cognitive effort, whatever, there are many things, many layers. And the the I think like translating all of these concepts of these phenomena processes, whatever, into an actual Bayesian mechanics is um is really like the what what's coming in fact, I think, in the next years. So and yeah, we'll see. And and as you said, beyond the 
analytical work, there is also the simulations, worked examples, whatever. Um, so yeah, I think there are many, many works to to be done and which are coming in the in the next years. I totally agree. Yeah, a kind of analogy that brings to mind is like early in the periodic table, not saying that we're studying material phenomena um, or even that elements are material phenomena, but it's kind of like, well, the rabbit has vision, taste, and hearing. So if we've identified a uh, memory in vision and taste, there's like a missing element for maybe it's not there. Maybe the memory for hearing is zero. Or maybe it's something very complex, but it's like, but there's a space there. It's like, there should be um, a rare earth metal in the fourth row. There should be an attention variable on this. And so it's kind of like a higher dimensional periodic table where because we know about certain patterns that are either kind of convergently arising in the real world because of what is life or they're um, convergently arising because we choose to model things a certain way, then that mm -hmm. brings a huge amount of concordance and juxtaposition like to the field of chemistry. Whereas previously there might've been air chemistry and water chemistry and fire chemistry. And then there'd be like, oh, but what happens when you throw water on a fire? Or what happens when the air in the room burns out? There'd be like these edge cases where it's like, oh, well, we don't do that. But that's what's happening when we don't have the unified model for cognitive systems. People will kind of study one phenomena or character of a system to its limits, but the limits of any phenomena in our highly woven life forms, like you don't chase it to the end. If you're studying foraging in the ant colony, it's not like there's a, okay, that was the end of the rainbow. Foraging is over. It's like, oh, well, foraging is related to nursing. And then that's related to this and the weather. It, it never just simply terminates with the inquiry. And um, possibly that could reflect the extremely early stage of this formalization. Possibly there are fundamental unknowns and adjacencies in our epistemic situation. Yeah, and I think, I mean, a few years ago, the idea of kind of extending physics to, in order to have an actual physics of cognition, it would be like uh, crazy, like uh, the Holy Grail. And the fact that we have this early works is quite an achievement. And I would also say that what's interesting here is that we already do have um, formal uh, models of many um, of many cognitive um, phenomena. For instance, you were talking about the, the paper of Lars about metacognition. Um, so we have very precise and formal active inference models, for instance, of many different uh, phenomena like uh, metacognition and so on. So in a way, we kind of already know what we should end up with. And the idea is uh, how to do, how to play, for instance, with the sparsity within internal states in order to go to get back or to rederive or refine what people are already modeled in a different literature earlier. So um, that's kind of the dynamics, I, I think. Um, so yeah, we, we'll see in the next years how it, it goes. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. A few more thoughts on that. Like a lot of the uh, adjacencies and generalizations, mathematicians and physicists and statisticians, they're experts in this. Like if it was a fixed number, see if it could be variable. If there wasn't a variance, see if you can add a variance. If it was this kind of distribution, mm -hmm. swap it out for like, there are these kind of syntactic moves that barely require much more than just like, yeah, these are the swaps we make. Like, this is what it looks like to generalize a theory. It's like we could add a variance on it, you know, all, all so those kinds of um, mm -hmm. familiar moves. And then, um, 
so much can be explored on this topic, but when we think about a physics of cognitive systems or a physics of cognition, sometimes I feel like I have one foot like is, it's like tied or somehow trailing with the reductionism. Like it's hard to escape the material basis and it's also not clear if we want to escape the material basis because of physics of cognitive systems. On one hand, it might address this kind of like thermo info negentropic Schrodinger what is life question about persistence and order of kind of quasi crystals or leave all that mess separate mess and beauty the pure Bayesian mechanics, if we just say, okay, now we're in the map, we're, we're leaving the territory behind. We're not going to talk about the actual calories and the thermodynamics. We're just on the map and a massive prior with a little attention is like a piece of sand hitting a mountain and a very loose prior with a highly attended to data point is like a bowling ball, you know, smashing through a small little um, heap of sand. So it's like, there's a physics to the collision of incoming data and prior, which is the Bayesian setting. So it's interesting that there's a sort of map Bayesian mechanics that kind of non-controversially describes the collision of priors of different mass in a way and then the tantalizing question or connection is whether that is like one in the same or an enabling factor or a downstream factor of this actual thermo informational autopoiesis for living systems. If, if I may add something, I think here, the, uh, I mean, an interesting point is that if you have, for instance, um, I mean, I, I don't want to to go there really, but if okay. I, <laughs> we have, <laughs> if I have a software which is which can be implemented by many sort of hardware, for instance, um, and this idea was actually a lot de debated in the when it came to functionalism and stuff like that. But anyway, here the such a Bayesian mechanics, in a way, it's the physics of um, how um, um, how the, the, the overall system should behave, but we, so there is, for instance, the minimization of this uh, free energy functional, but we are not saying how the, um, here we, we do not um, uh, explicitly say how the system uh, actually does the computations. We just say that a sparsely coupled random dynamical system has somehow to do that stuff. And in a way it is neutral about what, um, what the, the actual system is made of. Um, it's like when we say that the free energy principle is more a framework than a process theory or stuff like that. Um, but I mean, I, 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 I um, I don't know very much about these uh, questions. <laughs> I, I, I think that's that's a great point. It's like, that's why a program or an operating system can be run when a different processor is brought in, just within a kind of mm. classical computing setting. Um, as a cognitive mapping or cognitive modeling framework, like, we don't know if that rabbit is a real biological rabbit that rabbit might be a deep fake rabbit and we're interacting with it through a video channel and we think that we're doing behavioral research on a real rabbit but it's just a really convincing synthetic data rabbit um we don't know because we're only getting the observations that we're getting and then we can tell any number of possibly compatible stories or interpretations about the data we're getting and mm -hmm to say more or to go further, like that's stepping past the boundary of the actual observations we're making, 
which is great. Like we want to propose hypotheses for what we're not directly observing. That's the whole point of latent states and everything. And yet there is this line where it's like you can kind of falsely push the known knowns beyond where they really are. Um, and it seems like one example of that is going down and specifying the actual mechanistic basis of a given computational function. And that that's, if that's important to specify, then the work itself is to specify it. However, at the framework level, the framework's absence of that kind of a material substrate, like that's the feature. That's not a, a lacuna in the framework. That is like, there's the USB stick and then there's where you can plug it in. That is the plug-in to any system. And if there was something already pre-plugged in there, like, well, it has to happen on Turing computer or it can't happen on Turing computer. That would have just mm -hmm. hobbled the scope of applicability by welding together what doesn't need to be welded. And I mean, if anything, this is a um, journey and a, a challenge about proper articulation and about how sparsity and nuancing which are connected to what brings us cognitive phenomena. So it's like, many things to learn and reflect on. Yeah, and if I may add a, a related remark um, about the, the question of having a top-down approach as opposed to a bottom-up approach, I think sociologically speaking and historically speaking, it's very interesting that the people who started developing Bayesian mechanics are people who are not like supposed to be professional physicists because i think when you it comes to like super emergent kind of phenomena like cognition whatever um the the the, the people who was training is precisely to learn uh about cognition about agency the people who kind of know everything about uh, what it takes to be an agent and so on. Th these guys are uh, neuroscientists, basically. So they, because they know what agency entails, they can be the good ones to propose an actual Bayesian mechanics, which is a very uh, top-down approach. Whereas if you go to the labs in like uh, physics of complex systems lab and stuff like that, people are pretty much um bottom up they will uh, for instance oh I, I want to study the brain so i'm going to write down the upfield model for instance so a kind of ising model where up is uh, an activated neurons and down um uh, 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 non not activated neurons and so i will have this very this very much uh, bottom up approach and i can which is super interesting and super important, but when it comes to this very much uh, emergent behavior, uh, the, the, the very emergent phenomena of the brain, metacognition, blah, 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 I can study for like five centuries the upfield model. I will never get any insight about the emergent behavior of the brain. And, um, and um, so I think here, the, 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 you have to have a, a top-down approach. You have to write a very generic uh, Langevin equation. And because you're a neuroscientist and because you know what it takes to do an inference, to, to be an inference machine, you're like, ah, conditional independence is, is very different, is very important, sorry. So let's try to inject in my Langevin equation some level of sparse coupling. And then, boom, you have the free energy principle. So even though, sociologically speaking, what's happening here might be super weird. Like, these guys are not supposed originally, at least, to be physicists. And they are supposed to, like, kind of generate the next chapter of physics. How weird is that? But in fact, 
In fact, I think there were precisely the, the good people to do that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I think there might be, oh, that's a great point. Uh, uh, there might be a fun history with physician, physician heal thyself and the alliance of medicine and physic. That's one point. Another point is um, low road and high road. And sometimes the, the disciplinary or the in-group conversation is like very low road. And then the idealistic and the aspirational is like high road. There, there, it doesn't exactly map to those, but I'm thinking of like somebody says like, I want to drive somewhere. I want to travel somewhere. There is no material basis for that travel yet. They're not there. There's no path. There's no car. And then in the mechanic shop, it's like, well, we have this tool, this object, like the low road, we're so surrounded by the low road that it supports this incremental research agenda using the tools and approaches that we have and their materiality. Whereas someone from outside the field, um, like comes to the ant researcher, it's like, have you had the ants build this new thing? And it's like, well, we, we weren't even on that path, but now that's like a new mm -hmm. North star and that can now draw work in that direction. And so it's kind of like yeah. the, the low road building out and then like the kind of um, the draw of the adjacent possible and the imagination that the high road kind of grounds in. All right. I'll ask a question from the live chat. Susan asks, what can one equation contain? I'm imagining how to interpret and translate self-modeling, how to approach foraging resources and opportunities. Uh, can you can you repeat, please? Yes, it's an open-ended question, so yeah, yeah. feel free to <laughs> however you like. What can one equation contain? I'm imagining how to interpret and translate self-modeling, how to approach foraging resources and opportunities. So I, 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 I could not answer the second part of the question, but if I can pick up on uh, about the question of uh, what, what these equations are all about, which is a bit what you asked last week, like what works the, do, does the framework do, what these equations contain or, or whatever. Um, if you actually simulate a sparsely coupled random dynamical system, and actually, there, are, there, there already are examples out there, for instance, in the 2021 paper called um, uh, uh, Marco, uh, Stochastic Chaos and Markov Blankets, if I remember well, with uh, Thomas Parr and Carl Friston and others. They simulate a, a, a coupled uh, Lorentz. Um, um, uh, systems, uh, if I if I remember well, and if you do um, simulate such systems which verifies such sparse coupling architecture, you observe the behavior which is described by your equations. And if, for instance, you remove fluctuations on particular states, so. Uh, well, your simulation, which follows the path of least action, which is given by your uh, equation, so it's it's um, it's it's uh, it does really work in the sense that it does describe indeed something. It's really a physics, in fact, of such uh, uh, sparsely coupled systems. Great question. I think we could explore more on what an equation can contain, but I'm just kind of struck by that. There's like a latent large set of um to be clarified axioms and conclusions and so on and when we see like one equation written here it's kind of like we're just seeing like one glimpse or one facet it's not like the other equations aren't in effect but sometimes it's a little unclear which equations are relevant but in an equation, um, we see a symbolic expression that 
within a given quantum reference frame, other, otherwise the Q and the A wouldn't mean anything, like w within a semantic reference frame, the equation is just kind of like a check. It's like if, it's like a, it's, uh, there's probably many ways that we can kind of explore what it does. But it's true that, I mean, I think many people who, in addition, don't necessarily have uh, a, a mathematical background or whatever. They have been, I, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in the history of the free energy principle, but a lot of people have been confused, especially in the early steps where it was, as Lenz uh, said um, many times, where it, when it was even more an intuition than a solid uh, framework properly grounded in solid math. So people did get a bit confused, I think, by with the math. But now it's, we have more and more worked examples, simulations, um, solid math, etc. So it's it's quite um, quite nice. Okay, in closing, we have explain it like I'm a 10 year old. Now that that response may reveal more about what somebody thinks 10 year olds are like. But now that we've been on this two part journey, you know, dot zip it and close it, Richard. <laughs> so explaining you mean uh, about what I just said, like uh, before? Just both sections or just our whole project. Now that now that we can look back at all the incredible quality summaries that we've provided. How do we just ah, cap okay. it and move forward with the child? Yeah. So I think everything we did here, so both in this presentation and the previous one, is um, so basically we can. So if I I I would so in order to say it in the most um, intuitive and simple ways, I would say that. Uh, very simply put, a system is just um, is just um, it, it, it's just some things interacting. Let's say so. It would literally correspond to a system as we use this word in a in a daily basis. Uh, uh, a, a pen is a system, uh, an organism, or any piece of. Uh, any um, collection of things interacting with each other, we, I'm, I can say this is a system. I just have to precisely delimitate um, and and say what are the boundaries of my system. And given a system which has a certain dynamics, there are um, certain laws, uh, physical laws, telling you how your system behave, how the things move around, and so on. And now, so. My system can be alone, like a, an asteroid in space, let's say, or it can be connected to each to other things I recognize as other systems. Um, two things can collide, two different things, systems can collide with each other, etc. For instance, and now if I assume several systems which are connected, meaning that they causally interact with each other in a certain sparsely way. So basically, in my schematic, you would have, uh, for instance, a system on the right, a system on the left, and a subsystem in the middle. So you have many uh, subsystems uh, causally interacting in a sparsely way. For instance, mu doesn't interact with eta. If I take a bacteria, for instance, it does move around and interact with other things outside the bacteria, but at the same time, within the bacteria, under the outer membrane, there, are, there is also stuff which do not interact, because they interact with the outside, let's say. And so if you have such uh, uh, sparse coupling architecture, as we say, we and where, and in, in, in a more technical term, Terms, we would say that the inside is uh, independent of the outside when conditioned on the intermediate system, let's say. So if we have such sparsely coupled systems, dynamical system, uh, we see mathematically speaking, we derive the fact that 
your system has to behave in a certain way. And in fact, when you do have such sparsely coupled dynamical system, you realize that everything uh, appears to, uh, I mean, if you look at, for instance, internal states mu here, the dynamics of this system uh, can be interpreted in terms of Bayesian inference, meaning that this system can be viewed as encoding a density over its external states, for instance. And if I had to define in a very simple way what it means to parameterize or to encode a distribution, I would say that um, your um, um, the various uh, parameters which define your system. For instance, uh, I said earlier that a system could be anything, a pen, an asteroid, whatever. There are variables which specify its state, for instance, temperature, pressure, uh, shape, whatever. I have a set of variables and I can view these variables, these numbers, literally, as I can take them and manipulate them as parameters of a mathematical quantity I, I, uh, I can deal with. And yeah, so I'm not sure if I failed in trying to uh, put it in, in a very, very simple terms, but I, I hope it makes sense. It was awesome. Richard, thank you for um, working to bring us these twin gems in the distillation work and really helping like consolidate and sediment on one hand, a long history of dynamical systems and physics. And on the other hand, papers coming out two weeks ago as well. So hopefully we'll continue the adventures and um, see you around. Yeah, thank you. And thank you uh, for the chat, the questions on the chat. Cool. Peace, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.